النبي على عدوك وعدونا إلى الحق يا أمين اللهم إنا نسكو ليك فقد نبينا صلوات فر عليه وآله وغيبة ولينا وكثرة عدونا وقلة عدمنا وشدة الفتن بنا وتظاهر الزمان على على ذلك بفتح منك تعجله وبضر تكشفه ونصر تعزه وسلطان حق تظهره ورحمة منك تجددناها وعافية منك تلبسناها برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين ورأيك الشهود محمد وآل محمد صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وآل
صلی اللہ علیہ محمد علیہ وسلم سورہ فاتحہ مرحوم بزرگ جناب ظاہر امروی صاحب کے مرسی کے بس چار بندے کو بہر نماز صبح ہو جو مشکل کو چاہ چلے بہر نماز صبح ہو جو مشکل کو چاہ چلے بے وہ کے اور یتیموں کے حاجد رواں چلے سر کھول کر باہت سے قیر برا چلے اور بولی قضا کے قلق سے اب مرتضی چلے بولی قضا کے قلق سے اب مرتضی چلے اور تات کو حق کی جانب مسجد رواں ہوئے گھر سے خدا کے آزمے باقی جنا ہوئے گھر سے خدا کے آزمے باقی جنا مشغول تے نامازے تحجد میں مرتدا اور سجدے میں ابن مجمے بے دین کی جفا ہے ہے نماز ہے فجر بھی کرنے نہ دی ادا ظالم روزے دار کو مجروح کر دیا ظالم روزے دار کو مجروح کر دیا اور حالت ہوئی تغیر چاہے دی پناہ کی سجدے سے سر اٹھاتے ہی حیدر نے آگا کی سجدے سے سر اٹھاتے ہی حیدر نے آگا کی مولا یہ دل کو تام کے بولے پدر فدا بیٹا مقام ہے صبر ہے مالک جو رضا ٹکڑے کلے جا ہے میرا غم سے نہ کر میری جگہ حسن ہے سلام مت رکھے خدا میری جگہ حسن ہے سلام ہر ایک وقت آئے گا کہ حسن بھی نہ ہوں گے لاتے پہ تیرے زینب و شبیر روئیں گے لاشے پہ تیرے شبرو شبیر رو بولے حسن سے پھر یہ امام پلا بیٹا رہا ہے کون کے جو ہم رہے مدا بس خدا کا نام رہے گا بلا کلا اب تم نماز فجر پڑا ہو کے غوئی ماں اب تم نماز فجر پڑا ہو کے غوئی ماں ارے ہم بیٹھ کر عبادتِ رب اولا کرے پھر مومنوں کے ہا 
حق میں ہما پہ دعا کریں پھر مومن حق میں ہما پہ دعا شہزاد پڑھتے غم پہ تھے مسجد میں بے قرآ تینوں اگر یتیم تو مسکین عشبہ چہرہ تزد غش میں تے مولا روز سب رو رہے تے دیکھ کے حضرت کا حال ذات سب رو رہے تے دیکھ کے ارے عباس پوچھتے تھے یہ کس نے ستام کیا بابا کے بلے لے کیوں نہ میرا سر قلام کیا بابا کے بلے کیوں نہ میرا سر قلم کیا بہر نماز صبح جو مشکل کو چاہ چلے سروا دیجئے محمد علیہ وسلم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم First of all, request for one Surah Fatiha. Include the name on our memorial board. Your Mahumeen, all Shodha, and particularly the sponsors of today's Majlis, they are Mahumeen, one Surah Fatiha. As you know that today is a Amal night, it's a, and uh, it's the first Shab also of Shahadat. Uh, so we will start our program with a speech, and after this speech there will be a, a Nohakhani, probably we'll keep it one Noha, not long, and then followed by the Amal of 19th of, uh, 19th of uh, Ramzan, inshallah. So that, uh, program will last about plus minus one hour, the Amal, inshallah. So um, after the Noha Khani, we'll give a break, five minute break for the wudu and uh, so that you can prepare for the Amal. Uh, one thing like I've mentioned yesterday and Nadim also mentioned during the Namaz and Maghrib band that uh, um, the incident happened yesterday in a parking lot with our caretaker Elvis. Um, so if you know somebody that who did this uh, rude behavior with him, <clears throat> or if you are one of you, I know that most of our community members, they don't do it like this. Yeah, they don't behave rudely with Elvis. So he's deciding to quit tonight because of bad behavior. And it is just like parking lot issue that um, parking lot was full and that individual was trying to enter the building with no parking space inside. So. Just consider it if you know that who was that individual, or if he's here, go and apologize him. It will impact the whole community, run up the Islamic society. He's a part of us, he's a, like a family member to us, and uh, he's always here um, to, to help us to run this program. Like we are, he's all equally important. Um, another quick uh, <clears throat> uh, discussion or I mean the introduction about the uh, city of knowledge you know that a lot of our committee uh, our members kids uh, goes to city of knowledge not far from here then the Islamic society is about two miles from here um, Dr. Shakely which is uh, heading this school since long time and most of you know her they want to give a short talk about their uh, progress about their status 
and the city of knowledge so with your loud salawat dr uh, shakli ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my personal relation with zainabia goes to more than 30 years ago when the marhum uh, brother naqwi was actively involved and where Babar Zaidi was a young unmarried man at the time. And uh, I feel really Zainabia as my second family. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Halima Shaikri, the principal and co-founder of the City of Knowledge Islamic School in Pomona. I'm here tonight to just remind you of three things. Um, first, you know, City of Knowledge, for those who don't know, was established in 1994 with a mission to create an environment in which the spiritual and intellectual qualities of human beings blossom. At that time, as a bunch of young parents, we realized that the public school does not meet the needs of our children. However, at that time, there were a little more decency in the environment. Today, with everything that's going on with the gender, agenda that is being forced on our children. And with the confusion that's there, I think public school is not a place for our students. Our respected Sheikh, uh, yesterday, he eloquently addressed this beautifully. So these children are an amana. The first reminder is that these children are an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have this amana and we are supposed to take care of it. If you have an option like City of Knowledge, I think you should explore that option. And if you are a talented person and a resourceful person, you should put your resources in this institution for the good of your own child and for the good of the rest of the children of the community. Because the Prophet said, Kullukum ra'an wa kullukum masulun an ra'ayate. It's, it's, these children are everybody's children. That's the first reminder. The second reminder is that City of Knowledge has a bunch of programs that we do, which are really designed and geared to enhance the spiritual aspect of the children and their Islamic identity. We have plays like the Karbala play, we have the Mubahala play, Ghadir play, Hadith al-Kisa play, which has a beautiful, this on the 15th of Ramadan for the birthday of Imam Hassan. And we have lots of other plays and activities and uh, picnics and eat carnivals. I really would like to see my brothers and sisters at Zainabia to connect with the school and be present, show a presence for these children because they get their inspiration and they get, they get their energy and they get their pride by the numbers that they see present in their events. That said, inshallah on Friday, April 5th, we have a Sahur program. We invite you all of you to join us. Starts at 10.30 and goes, I think, till 3 a.m. And also on the 12th of April, we come back from spring break. We have a Eid festival at school during the Friday. And uh, it is also an open house for those who want to explore the city, city of Knowledge School. This was my second point. My third one is we have a lot of resources in the community. We have a lot of talented people. We really, you know, as my, speaking of myself, you know, I am I am one of the founders of the school, and uh, we did what we can do. But the continuation of the school, the improvement of the school, the betterment of the school, and the sustainability of the school depends on you, on all of you. It's not a one person's responsibility. So I invite you, all of you, to come forward and connect with the school and give this resource to the school. Along with that comes financial assistance to the school. Many of my donors are in this crowd. And uh, I just remind you that, you know, you give to Zainabia and you give to City of Knowledge and you give to 10 other institutions. All what happens is that your wealth will multiply, inshallah, with an, uh, with an added bonus to the Akhirah. Jazakumullah khaira jazak. Assalamu alaikum. So my name is Ahmed Al-Hankawi. I'm a City of Knowledge alumni. 
I graduated the year of 2019. Uh, today, I'll just be talking briefly about the alumni from City of Knowledge, because really that's the product of the service that the school provides. And so just for a bit of background about City of Knowledge, we're a pre-K to 12th grade Shia Islamic school. We're uh, compliant with California Common Care Curriculum. We're College Board approved. We're UC approved. We're WASC accredited. That's the governing body uh, for our school. We're also an AP capstone diploma school. And we've been designated as among the top 5% of all STEM schools within the nation. So with that said, the two main things I want to talk about regarding our alumni are the academic achievements of our students as well as the Islamic identity that City of Knowledge gives to its students that they hold on to long after graduation. So regarding the academics, alhamdulillah, we've always had a really strong uh, college admission track record. Nearly all of our students, it's well above 90% upon graduation. They're uh, accepted into a four-year bachelor's program. And among those programs, uh, many of our students are also getting into some of the best schools within the country. I know the year after I graduated, there was a girl who got into Stanford on a full scholarship. Uh, the year that I applied, we had students that got into Pomona College, USC, UCLA, Berkeley. And generally, that's kind of the trend that we have for City of Knowledge. And uh, besides just getting into these really good universities after graduating, our alumni excel and they're the top performers within their fields. Just from my class, we have students who are, I had to ask them just before this, we have students who, who are uh, going into law school, engineering, uh, students getting their PhDs. And for myself, uh, I applied to medical school this year uh, during my gap year after graduating and I'm gonna be going into UCLA and uh, medical school this summer, alhamdulillah. Aww. Thank you, and so just, and just as importantly, on the spiritual front, uh, what Dr. Shaikhli just mentioned, the Karbala play, the Quran, the ethics, the Arabic, all of that, I went to City of Knowledge from fourth grade all the way till 12th grade, and from the very beginning, uh, that was like one of the main things we had within our, within our education. So it wasn't just the purely the academic front, we had all of these Islamic things that were installed in us from the very beginning. And that really shows, I think, after we graduate. So my closest friends are alumni from City of Knowledge. And uh, we all go together to the mosque. We all make sure to volunteer at the mosque. Uh, we still help with the Karbala play. We helped just this year and also the year before. Two of my closest friends are working on the board at uh, the mosque of Ahlul Bayt. One's already in his career. The other's, uh, he's doing engineering. He's just going to graduate. And uh, I think it speaks volumes to see that so many of the students, right after they graduate, they make sure that they really stick close to the community. And uh, yeah, I think that's something that's so invaluable regarding City of Knowledge. And so I just wanted to share that. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to pass it on to the next. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Masuma Fatima. I'm a junior attending Beautiful City of Knowledge. As a young Muslim struggling to keep my faith and identity strong, City of Knowledge not only changed my life spiritually, but academically as well. Compared to public school, which offers an average of eight AP courses throughout high school, City of Knowledge offers 15 plus APs, giving students the chance to excel in their chosen subjects. Although classes can get a bit challenging with overwhelming loads of work, our school's hardworking teachers provide advanced lessons and are dedicated to helping all students succeed. As for K-8 through students, City of Knowledge ties in fun activities such as participating in essay competitions, spelling bees, and Quran recitations with cash rewards and parties to help embed daily skills into their minds. City of Knowledge recently built a smart lab where students take APCSP, APCSA, learn about computers, and create online games. Along with regular classes, City of Knowledge provides advanced Quran and Arabic classes, which is what's most important in our lives as Muslims. Starting from connecting basic Arabic letters to reciting the Adhan during prayer time, City of Knowledge is where you should send your young Muslims to keep their faith strong as they conquer through their K-12 through years. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu My name is Sakima Fatima and I am a senior at my beautiful school, City of Knowledge. 
As a student who switched from being in public school my whole life to suddenly attending an Islamic private school, I had no idea what changes were coming my way. I would say there were some minor changes and some major changes, but all for the better. See, the knowledge offers nothing but the best for all those students, and that is something I learned after attending. After becoming a part of the CKS family, I realized that this is where I not only needed to be, but wanted to be. CKS offers many wonderful classes and extracurriculars. Just as public school offers sports, ASB, and robotics club, CKS offers the same. We have amazing soccer coaches, an amazing ASB group, which I am the president this year, and a wonderful robotics club led by one of our wonderful seniors. Everyone in the school feels like your family and feels like they are your own. Every day we have both Doha and Asr prayer in school and have Quran and ethics class. Our lovely teacher, Brother Haider, teaches us ethics twice every other week, and mashallah, he is the best teacher ever. Very knowledgeable and very well spoken. Then, we have our wonderful teacher, Sister Salam, who teaches Quran every single day. She also leads us in having our amazing plays, such as the Kaaba play, Hadith al Kisa play, and the Adam and Eve play. City of Knowledge is not your regular school, but a school that not only offers the best classes that will prepare you for the future, but the most genuinely learning classes. I'm a proud student of CKS, and inshallah, you will all send your kids as well. Thank you. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is um my name is Omar Khan. I'm in sixth grade, and uh, aside from learning, we have uh, we we also offer a lot of physical activities and sports like basketball, soccer, and volleyball. That's all I really want to say. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad Ali, and I'm a proud student of City of Knowledge. And I think you should donate to our school because it is also your school. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Samira. Um, first and foremost, I am a Zainabia Islamic Society community member. Um, my husband also serves on the board. So um, other than that, I teach here at Zainabia Sunday School. So you might, some of you might have kids who go here. Uh, besides that, I'm a full-time software, a senior software engineer at Harris Healthcare, and we develop EHR systems, electronic health record systems. I work in Angular, uh, JavaScript. That's my you know, full-time profession. Uh, but besides that, I try to manage my life around City of Knowledge for the last 14 years. I've been teaching in various capacities as a high school, middle school teacher. Right now, like uh, for instance, Sakina Masuma, they're all my students uh, in AP Capstone program. I also teach statistics, like math is my math and computer science is my major. Um, other than that, my son Ali Hassan here is uh, graduating um, from elementary this year, so he's in fifth grade. Um, just want to remind you guys, you know, we have to help. Uh, you guys are professionals. You have the best doctors, engineers, researchers, scientists, you know. Uh, um, who did I miss? Lawyers, teachers in our community. So please step up, help uh, build our school. You know, we have a, a, and help build your kids' identities. Um, we want to invest in this school. It's our collaborative, uh, you know, community school. So please um, we're looking forward for your support. So uh, come up, you know, to our programs. Uh, they're on weekends and at times, like Dr. Shakely mentioned, the Sohur program. So they're not conflicting with other centers. I know everyone's busy with so much going on, all the Ibadah and Ramadan. So please, let's take some time to reflect and uh, make sure you're, we're doing all this community building for the good of our kids. Thank you and Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. So as you know that, I mean, we have a lot of resources in our community. You know that we have uh, started the ZIS uh, professional series also a couple of months back, in fact, last month. And then more are coming after Eid, inshallah. So we are working on that. Uh, you will uh, hear that uh, what will be the next topic. But the resources are available in Zanabia Islamic Society also. If somebody is interested in learning mathematics or calculus or stats, there are resources available. Let us know. We can help you, connect you to the people who can uh, help you in education. And mashallah, that City of Knowledge staff was here, and uh, the school is just next to us. So it's not very far. So without any delay, with your loud salawat, I would request Malana Sayyid Hassan Rizvi to come to the member and address the mic list.
Ameen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, one more loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi s-sami al-a'li min ash-shaytan al-a'in al-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa bihi nasta'in La hawla wa la quwata illa billah Illa billahi al-a'li al-a'zim Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala ash-shif al-anbiya wal mursaleen Bil-qasim al-mustafa Muhammad ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذنومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد مؤمنين مؤمنات brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We started a few nights ago talking about the purpose of fasting. We talked about this need for trying to figure out how we can learn how to control ourselves, right? We said a part of that is to know who we really are, right? To understand our identity, what it means to be a Muslim, what it means to be a mu'min. And then we started to think about, okay, all of that will be meaningless unless we kind of figure out the purpose for our creation too. Like why were we made in the first place, right? That's obviously tied to our identity. So last night we were talking about this idea that we are the only ones who have been given free will. We are the special creatures that Allah has created, so there must be some magical reason that you and I are here. We talked about that, okay, Allah is needless, so it's not like He has something that He has to do for us. So there has to be some reason that we have to understand that will help us then understand our true value, our true selves, and that will hopefully help us create that willpower that we need so we can engage in self-control a bit better. We said, when we're thinking about the reason for creation, not just for us as Muslims or insan or the world or the universe, in general, we said, look, there's always two different ways of looking at it. Whenever you have some item or something, some invention, we said there's two ways of understanding the purpose of it. We said, one is you look at that item or that invention itself, like it has its own purpose, what it solves, what it you know performs its functions that's one thing but then you also have the idea of okay the person who created it what was their reason it's not always the same right we give the example right elon musk he makes all this stuff each of those things they have their own function and purpose but the reason he might have made it is probably just for money right some people they start a business they have a specific reason in mind maybe they are philanthropists maybe they're doing it to help out their community but not always right so it just depends there's another example that we were going to give, but I think I'm going to move on so that we have some time for the Amal tonight. But I hope that point is understood. So the reason we said that is because there's two different ways we can answer this question as well. When we normally think about, you know, why did Allah make us? We're normally thinking about it from the perspective of what is the point? What's our reason for being here? What is our function as insan? Why are we here as humans? That's one thing we have to answer. Then there's another one too. Because we have our own purpose, our hadaf, our maqsad, we have those things. But then, okay, Allah, is that reason that we have, is it the same reason that you had when you made us? That might be the same thing and it might be something different. And it might be linked, right? So we have to see if we can try to answer both of those tonight, inshallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we tried to introduce, to try to figure out, okay, you know, how can we come about this answer? Right? Let's look, of course, at the Quran and Ahlul Bayt. We started with the Qur'an. So look, Allah obviously makes it fairly clear, right, in one ayah of Qur'an. Why did you make us? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says, look, I, the only reason I made jinn and humans is what? To do ibadat of me. Like, okay, thank you. Like, what? That's not enough. Like, is it just a bunch of actions, worship? That's the only reason we're here? Like, it seems kind of superficial, right? Like, just to do a bunch of things, like task lists, that's it? Doesn't make sense. There's got to be some greater purpose. Say, okay. So we looked into the riwayat. We saw that the uh, imams have done tafsir of this part. They said, يعبدون يعني ليعرفوني. That this idea of ibadat of Allah is really ma'rifat of Allah. That's what it means. Like, okay. So now we're going a bit deeper now. 
The only reason that we have been created is for ma'rifat of Allah. Like, okay. That's it. And close the book. No, like, okay, what do you mean ma'rifat of Allah? What does that mean? Right? Something we say all the time. Yes, I want ma'rifat of Allah. Ma'rifat of the Quran. Ma'rifat of Ahl Bayt. What does that mean? Does that mean that just memorize a bunch of things? You know, act like a parrot and just say, yeah, Allah ik and panch and all these other things. Memorize some surahs. No, it can't be that. It's got to be something deeper, right? So that means we have to unpack this a little bit more. So the way I want to start to unpack this is by first looking at a hadith attributed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So in this narration, a Bedouin right, comes to Rasulullah, asks, asks him this question. He says, Ya Rasulullah, alimni min gharaib al He says, Ya Rasulullah, teach me the ajib and gharib. These wonders, like the, the deepest types of ilm possible. Now you might be thinking, okay, it's Rasulullah, he's going to give him all this deep knowledge now. Look, just because somebody comes and asks for deep knowledge doesn't mean you get the answer right away. Right? You know, sometimes what happens is you and I, we want these deep answers. You know, I get these questions all the time. Manana, why, why are dogs nudges? Like this is everybody's like deep philosophical question. That's what's bothering everybody. <laughs> why are dogs nudges? Why is Maghrib three rakats? Why are only some namazes qasr and they get cut in half and other ones are not? Like all these kind of random things. We're like, yes, I need, I need to know that deep philosophy, the deep irfani spiritual reason for all that. Hold on, slow down, all right? Maybe we're not ready for those answers yet, right? There's usually muqaddamah for all these things. Did you skip the muqaddamah? Rasulullah tells us that one person says, hold on a second. He says, ma sana'ata fi ra'as al -ilm. He says, what do you understand, what do you know about this start of ilm before you start asking me about the ajib and gharib things? Hatta fil iman wal islam. Like even for just Islam and Iman, do you even understand those? Those basic concepts? وَمَا يَتَعَلَّقْ بِهِمَا And the relationship between Islam and Iman? Like, do you even understand that? You're asking for ajib and gharib things? You want the depths of knowledge? Like you're not ready for that. Do you understand the basics of Islam and Iman yet? Like you don't. And then he says, تَسْأَلْ عَنْ غَرَائِبِهِ What gives you the right to ask for the gharib and the deep wonders of this deen when you haven't gotten the basics yet? But he's asking him, he's like, do you know the basics, right? That's what he's kind of, he's asking as a kind of rhetorical device, right? Like, do you know what you're asking for here? Do you have, you know, the first step here? Is it in order to talk about all this? And, you know, some people, they don't do that. So the, the Bedouin responds. He says, okay, you're asking me if I, you know, know the start, the beginning, the foundation of knowledge. He doesn't. So he says, okay, وَمَا رَأْسُ الْعِلْمِ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Okay, you're asking me, I don't know it, so now he's asking, okay, Rasul, Ya Rasulullah, what is this beginning, foundation, inception? Give me the foundation, the Rasul Ilm. Okay, what is it? I don't know what it is. Rasulullah answers, Ma'rifatullah haqqa ma'rifati. What is the beginning of Ilm? It's Ma'rif of Allah haqqi ma'rifati. The way, the haqq that Allah deserves. There's different levels of ma'rifa. We can make up a small level of ma'rifa, but there's a true level of ma'rifa that you and I have to have, and that's the beginning of Ilm. We thought it was going to be a simple answer, like, okay, ma'rifat, well, we're back where we started. Like, hold on a sec, what is that? But don't worry, we're in the same position as this, this poor Bedouin guy who's getting chewed out over here, right? It's like, okay, he's like, ma ma'rifat Allah haqqa ma'rifati. It's like, okay, I asked you what's the start of ilm, you said it's true ma'rifat of Allah. Okay, well, what is true ma'rifat of Allah, ya Rasulullah? Like, you see, at least the good thing is, he doesn't say, oh, cha cha, and he walks away. It's like, I don't know this. He's humble enough to say, okay, tell me, I don't know these things, which is a good start. It's like, okay. Rasulullah answers, An ta'rif ta bila mithl wa la shabi wa la nid. It's that you have the ma'rif of Allah, so you understand that there is no mithl. There's nothing like Allah. There's no misal. There's nothing that's similar to Allah. There's no shabi. Nothing can be compared to Him. There's no nid. There is nothing at all that's like Allah whatsoever. Okay, that's one. Then he says, Wa annahu wahidun ahad. Know that He's wahid, that He's one and ahad, unique. You have to know that too. Zahir wa batin. Allah is apparent, He's in our face, and He's batin, He's also hidden. He's both of these things. Awal wa akhir. He's the first and the last. La qaqwa lahu wa la nazir lahu. Kind of saying the same thing. There is no sort of example you can give that will get you close to what Allah really is. There's no nazir, there's no examples. There's nothing that's even close to Him in similarity. It's not going to happen. فَذَٰلِكَ حَقِّ مَعْرِفَتِي If you get all these things, that's the haqq of Allah's ma'rifa. And you're like, okay. You tell me, Hassan, I know all that stuff. I know that there's nothing else like Allah. I got all that. Do you really think it is that simple? 
I answered all this stuff, right? We got it right from the hadith now. Do you think you have a good concept of real ma'rifah just from these answers? There's obviously something deeper here. If this is the purpose of our creation, then we're still missing something there. The answer is here, but there's still a little bit more we have to unpack. So let's go a bit deeper if you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Oh. Take a step back for a second. Just remind us how we started last night. He said, look, we know we're made with free will. We're trying to understand why that's the case, right? We know that there are other creations, angels and animals. They don't have free will. We know that, right? Both of them obey Allah without any hesitation, right? There's no argument there. They just do whatever Allah says. For angels, their ibadah is just pure divine things, right? Whatever Allah says, Ruku all the time, sujood all the time, tasbih all the time. They just do it. Simple. They're just programmed robots. That's all they are. And they obey Allah. Simple, right? So all they are are just these pure creations of nur, or according to some. It's just they're pure aql. That's what they are. They're pure aql. That's all they're going to do is whatever makes sense and what they've been programmed with. That's it. Animals are also like that, but the opposite way. So they also obey Allah. They don't deviate from what Allah tells them. But what we don't really call what they do worship necessarily. We call it instinct, right? Animal instinct. They go, they move around, they go for food, they procreate, they survive, that's it. They never deviate from that programming. So both angels and animals, both are just given this programming and they don't move from there. So they don't really have you know, much of a purpose besides what Allah's programmed and that's it. They're kind of done, right? Game over for them. Okay. So from them, thinking from their perspective, is there any growth possible for an angel or for an animal? Is there any kamal for them? No. If an angel can, is just going to do whatever Allah says, you say, oh, isn't that perfect? Well, they are what they are. There is no growth. They won't get better, they won't get worse. For an animal, same thing. They can't get better, they can't get worse, because they're just going to do whatever they're told. Both angels and animals are in that kind of same boat, right? Nothing's changing for them. Like, okay. The jinn? It's, we don't talk about that after Maghrib, sorry. This is for the... It's funny you mentioned that. You know, these are the things that people ask about. They talk about, ask about jinn. This is from Gharaib, right? So let's go back to Islam and Iman. Then we can talk about the jinn. Understand insania, then we can talk about the jinn as well. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. No, some people in some communities, they ask me if they can do a nikah with the jinn. I'm like, you guys are asking the wrong questions, man. Why don't you marry a human first, then we can talk about jinn. Ya Allah. Khair. Now, think about this for a second. Do we, do we think that either angels or animals, do they enjoy what they do? Of course. You think so? Yeah, everybody agree? You think angels enjoy what they do? What does it mean to enjoy something? To derive pleasure from something? To be razi with something? What does that mean? Do they understand what they're doing? They don't have free will, right? We would assume that you know, free will has something to do with this, right? Yeah, very good, Hamza. Nice, nice job. But don't ruin it for everybody, right? <laughs> Give them some time and then you can jump it at the end, right? Okay. So let's step back. Let's go back to us as humans, right? We know what it's like to enjoy things, obviously, right? So we know, for example, let's go to the five senses. We know when things taste good, right? So whatever. I have a nice piece of filet mignon, for example. I'm enjoying it, right? It's nice, medium rare. Obviously, we don't go beyond that. I know some of you, some of you are still in the situation where you're doing medium, rare, medium well and things like that. Um, it's a little blasphemous, but you know, maybe you go out for ice cream and getting Oreo flavored stuff. Like, yeah, it's delicious, right? We enjoy things. We enjoy certain things, or especially it's the month of Ramadan. That first bite of that kajur, that first sip of water, that sip of chai, ah, right? You feel that, like, ah, this is nice. Any other time of the year, outside of when we're fasting, it's just, okay, maybe you'll enjoy it a little bit. I right? mean, you wake up, that first sip of coffee, or that first bite, whatever it is, you know, might enjoy it. But nothing is like when you do iftar, right? Nothing's like that. It's a different feeling altogether, right? Especially, again, it's a long day at work, driving through all this traffic, right? Somebody's bothering you with gin questions or something, right? <laughs> Something's going on. <laughs> it's a joke, it's okay. <laughs> so now you got a headache, you're tired, and this and that. Namaz, you're wondering, like, why is this Mulana taking so long in Namaz, right? I don't know what you're worrying about, right? And finally you come, you have that sip of water, oh, alhamdulillah, right? So there's a whole different feeling behind that. You can enjoy it. So that's about taste. Looks is the same thing, too. Sometimes 
You go, some of, I don't know how many of you enjoy art, things like that, right? or nice scenery, right? You have a lot of things in nature over here. You go look at the mountains or the hills. You see a painting at a museum, right? You go and you enjoy, you're like, ah, this, this is nice. It gives you a good feeling. Even atheists understand that, right? They say, yeah, we look out sometimes into the night sky. We see the stars, look through a telescope, like, wow, it looks beautiful. Right, you know, some of these nights when you see that full moon, like, man, it's just so bright. It's like amazing. Oh, subhanAllah, like this, you feel good and stuff. So we can see that something looks beautiful. Right? Sometimes you drive by certain buildings and you kind of understand you're attracted by the beauty and the engineering and the architecture, right? Especially when you see some of these masajid overseas, right, in certain Islamic countries. Like, wow, this is amazing. It's beautiful. So we notice these things. In terms of our feelings as well, too, right? When you're in your bed, assuming you have a comfortable bed and your pillow, right? That nice feeling after a long night of a'mal sometimes, right? We're up almost all night, right? We're really, really tired, late, you know, long drive home, and we finally lay down in bed. Ah, oh, right? It's just that, ah, it feels nice. That feeling, you know, we feel good too. Now, the question is this. Why do we have all of these good feelings? Good taste, things looking good, feeling good, smelling good, things sound good. Why do we get all these things? Why, can, why do we have a sense of goodness in the first place? How do we know that something's actually good? So why is, there this, why is this idea, how do I know that something is actually good? Because I know that, what? Something's bad. I know the opposite. If I didn't have something that tasted gross or disgusting or plain, then I wouldn't enjoy filet mignon as much, right? If I didn't have, let's say, a... Uh, let's say, a coffee that was either too bitter or whatever, and I had a proper coffee, I would never enjoy that coffee the same way, right? You know, there's some people who know how to make chai, there's some people who don't, right? Some people, too much water, some people, you know, too much sugar, some people, the whole thing is elaichi, I don't know, everybody makes their chai a little differently, right? Everybody thinks that they're making the best chai, but we know that's not the case for everybody, right? But we know good chai because we also know bad chai, right? Same thing. When we enjoy the feeling of being in our bed or sitting in a nice, comfortable member seat, whatever it is, why? Because I've sat in a member that's not so comfortable before, right? So this is how we understand things. This is a principle that exists in philosophy. You get ma'rifat of something through what? Through its opposite, through its contradiction. That's how we know something. How do we know about lightness? Because we know what? Darkness. How do we know about goodness? Because we know badness, evil, right? We know things through their opposites. How do we feel cold? Because we know hot, right? That's how we understand all these things. They're all existing as in these comparisons. That's how we understand everything. So now let's go back to the angels and the animals. Do they have these kind of understandings? Hamza was alluding to it, right? Free will helps us understand the opposites of things. Now go back to the way the Riwayat was talking about this, right? We have knowledge because we also know ignorance. Ilm and ma'rifah because we also know jahl. I know what it feels like when I have a question in my mind. I'm looking for some information. And then when I finally learn it, I get that feeling, right? It's not a physical feeling. It's something in my soul. Why? Because I knew what it felt like to not know that. And then something within me just changed. And, ah, oh, man, it feels good to know. But sometimes we have these questions. I'm going to pick on you so much, Uncle. Sorry about the gin thing, right? But yeah, sometimes these questions sit in our minds. And then when we finally hear a satisfactory answer, like, you know, I've, I've heard Adam Alana's answer it. I've read it online in books. Even chat GTP, you know, GPT gave me this answer. It wasn't the best. But no, this answer that I just got, yeah, that I get it now. And it changes the way that you feel about it. Something internal changes in you. Right? We know that because we knew what it was like to not understand it too. So Ma'rifa and Jahl are sitting at opposing poles. Right? Let's move a little, a little bit deeper now and kind of unpack this a bit more if you can recite a salawat on Muhammad wa oh. <laughs> Another piece now. So we talked about the value of knowing the differences in things, the opposites in things, right? Goodness. Now let's talk about the idea of free will versus being forced, right? This idea of compulsion. So before we were talking about, okay, everything like jinns, uh, jinn and humans are made for ibadat, right? Okay, let's just go with that simple understanding. Let's say we took a robot and just programmed it with all of the, you know, furu'ad deen. And a robot just did all this stuff. Fasted perfectly, read every single namaz perfectly, read Quran perfectly, did everything perfectly. Does that robot have any actual value to it? 
This is programmed, right? It doesn't have the ability to go against it, right? Yeah, once this AI becomes self-aware and conscious and Skynet comes and all this other thing happens, then yeah, then that's when things are going to get a little scary. But for now, when you program something, like, okay, this robot that's doing it has no value. But yeah, when you have, let's say, a young child, or somebody on their own says, yes, I want to go and pray. Why does that have value? Because they chose to do it. Because I exercised my own free will, my volition, my ikhtiyar. I said, I could have been doing something haram. I could have been doing something nonsensical. I could have gone to some other deen. I could have done anything that I wanted. I didn't have to come here tonight. But I decided to do it. I gave up some other desire, something of, of the dunya. I wanted to come here. I'm making a choice in all these things. That's what has value now. So when you take these two kind of pieces together, the fact that we know and are, understand the difference between good and evil, what is better, what's worse, good and bad, and all these things, what feels good, what feels bad, all these senses, we have something internal, and the fact that we can choose what's worse too. We can choose short-term pleasure over long-term pleasure. We have all these things at our disposal. This is what's actually giving us value, and this is actually the secret of ma'rifah. In order for us to really understand Allah, what is Allah? Allah is just perfection, right? Allah is just infinite perfection. In the simplest term, that's what Allah is, right? Just infinite perfection, the infinite amount of khair and goodness. That's what Allah is, in a nutshell. Okay, so how can I truly get ma'rifah of Allah then? But do I, can I be an angel and do that? No, I'm never going to get that. Can I be an animal? It's impossible. The only way for me to understand some level of perfection and infinite goodness is if I understand infinite badness too. If I want to understand perfection, I need to see imperfection. The only way I can get that is not if I'm with Allah, not with the angels or the animals. I have to be here in the dunya and I have to have the choice then. I have to be able to see what moving away from Allah looks like, moving away from Allah feels like, what it smells like and tastes like and sounds like, then I'll actually have value to Allah. In other words, if I want to experience and understand what heaven's going to feel like, then I have to go through hell too. And what is the dunya? The dunya is hell. That's what it is. It's a living hell. That's what it is. In other words, to get to heaven, you got to go through hell. And that's exactly what it is. If we were just plopped into heaven, would we understand and enjoy any benefit there? We'd have no idea. Again, yeah, same example I'm saying. All those things that we enjoy right now. If we were just given that straight up way, Allah just put me in heaven. Okay, here's all the food that you want. You know, uh, these couches you can recline on, these drinks. So we'd have it, but we had no idea that these taste good or bad because we had nothing to compare it with. The dunya gives us that comparison. Allah says, I want you to understand the perfection that's going to exist here. I want you to understand qurbatan illallah, to be close to me. The only way you can understand this qurb and being close to me is if I push you away for a little bit too. Let me push you away to the dunya and now you can choose. Do you want to come back towards me or not? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. You, you belong to me. Allah said, look, you're mine. You came from me. You can be with me as much as you want. And yes, eventually, every moment you're coming back to me. But you can choose now. Do you want to do this on your own? Do you want to start moving closer to me on your own, exercising your free will, doing everything, fi sabilillah, qurbatan illallah, all these things that I've commanded, which are perfecting your soul? Or are you going to get stuck in this dunya? Are you going to exercise your free will in this world of ghurur, of illusion and imperfection? If that's the case, then fine. This is what you get. You become ahl dunya then. You become somebody that lives in the finite world, the imperfect world. But then what's going to happen? These are all the people that are addressing the Quran. That once they die, they're like, oh, this is what I missed out on? Okay, Allah, send me back now. Hold on, I get it, now I get it. All the hijab is gone from me. Now I see the reality. Okay, Allah, send me back, I'm going to go do your ibadat now. No, 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 there's no second chances here. You had your chance here, I gave you an aql. I gave you the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. You had everything that you needed to. All of that was there. You had the free will, you had the choice. I showed you good and bad. I gave you the feelings. But you decided not to exercise it, and now you're going to see what your actions sent forward. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So the only way we get that ma'rif of Allah is by experiencing things which are outside of Allah. Bismillah. Dinosaurs, you know? and so 
so all this creation, mm. plants, different kinds of plants coming, shooting plants coming. So that's probably one of the one of the uh, foundation, I think, to understand this creative power. Awesome. Similarly, our, our uh, Imam al our Rasulullah or other, he is the he is the source of ultimate power. Mm-hmm. He is the supreme power. But he out of his power, he gave, he bestowed some power, his godly power, to Rasulullah uh, to make the uh, dead alive. One more lot, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Muhammad Awesome, thank you very much for sharing Yeah, that's one of the ways that Allah invites us in the Quran Right, to say look out at the world, look at creation Look at all this power and beauty Look at how everything's organized And this is how we come closer and closer, right? And even here, one of the things is that we see With all this beauty, there's obviously There's things missing too, right? We see the the, the things that are naqis in this dunya But again, to show that, look, everything here in the dunya Don't chase after it The reason it's all here is to say, look, this is the nuqsan the, the, the deficiencies here So you understand, don't chase after it Chase after me instead, because that's where you get that true perfection Right? Asantum. One more salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Thank you very much for sharing Okay Now, we have two other points I think we, I'm going to go through tonight Before we move on so I want to tie in, just because it's the night where we're going to be uh, beginning with Amir al-Mu'mineen, I think I want to share just one riwayah by him. Uh, again, this is from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wassalam. <laughs> and again, ties into some of the points we were just mentioning before, right? It's a famous one. Most of you probably have heard it before. It's reported to have the إِنَّ اللَّهَ رَكَّبَ فِي الْمَلَائِكَ عَقْلَ بِلَا شَهْوَةً That Allah has composed and created angels with aql, but no shahwa. So they have this pure intellect, but there's no shahwa, there's no, there's no desires in it, right? So not chasing after anything. وَرَكَّبَ فِي الْبَهَائِمْ شَهْوَةً بِلَا عَقْلٍ But angels, they have your pure shahwa, their pure desire, but there's no aql in them, right? وَرَكَّبَ فِي بَنِي آدَمْ كِلْتَيْهِمَ But in Bani Adam, in humans, we get both. You get the aql and the shahwa. We have both of these powers now. فَمَنْ غَلَبَ عَقْلَهُ شَهْوَتَهُ Whoever decides lets their aql dominate and overpower their desires and their shahwa, for huwa khairun min al malaika. Then that person is better than the malaika. Right? So we don't need to be like the malaika. We can be better because we suppress our carnal animalistic desires. We rise above the angels. But now the other side too. Waman ghalaba shahwatuhu aqla. If we let our lower base carnal desires, little simple short term pleasure things, that dominates over the aql, then what happens? For huwa sharrun min al bahaim. This person's worse than an animal, right? Because we know better and we're still acting like animals, right? This is the way that we speak. There's a few other points that I want to go to. I think maybe I'll just quickly kind of go through this. So this point was about our reason. So this is these final points were about, okay, Allah, why did you make me? Like, what is our purpose in creation? Okay, it's for ibadat, to do ibadat of Allah. What do you mean by your ibadat? It means my ma'rifah. What do you mean by my ma'rifah? To understand Allah the right way. Well, what does that mean? That means truly understand how Allah is nothing like this place over here. As you were saying, we understand the dunya as much as we can. That will help us understand Allah in the way that He should be as well too. Of course, this comes down to the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt as well. So it's always understanding the dunya and how low and insignificant it is. And then at the same time, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than everything and beyond this. That's why I mentioned that hadith from Rasulullah, right? That he was saying what? Understand that there's a vahid, there's a batin, Allah's awwal and akhir, and there's nothing like him. And we understand all of that, it puts these opposites and these opposing ideas together. Right? So that was one thing. Now, that gives us our reason, tells us why we're here. The only way we can understand Allah is through this free will and being able to choose what's wrong. That's how we can actually benefit and understand what is in heaven. Okay, we got that. But Allah, 
why, what's your reason, though? Like, why did you even create in the first place? Anything at all. Especially us, but why just create? Why not just you know, sit around with your arms crossed and do nothing? Why did you even bother creating in the first place? So it's linked to this answer we gave, but it's a bit deeper than that. So this is why I need a little bit more special attention if you can recite a salawat on Muhammad wa Muhammad. So we get one clue from what we already mentioned, and it ties into one of these beautiful hadith al-Qudsis that, that comes. So again, this is obviously being narrated from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's saying what Allah is saying, right? That's how hadith Qudsi works. So he's saying that Allah has said this. It's a very famous hadith that you know, Sufis and Urafa narrate. That Allah is saying, Kuntu kanzan nakhfiya. That I was, what? A hidden treasure. Fa'ahbabtu an u'raf. I had this hub. I wanted somebody to get ma'rifat of me. Fa'khalaqtu al khalq. So because I had this love and desire that people have ma'rifat of me, then I decided to do khalq. I decided to create people. So that people can have ma'rifat of me. So this is one step towards Allah's reasoning, but we have to go a bit deeper. So one part we got. So Allah's saying, look, I'm this hidden treasure. If I'm unknown, that's a problem. Why is that a problem? So we understand Allah's perfection. Regardless of whether he creates or not, he's perfect. No nuts, no issues, no deficiencies, nothing like that. But here, there is actually one problem, though. Let me give you an example. Hopefully, it'll help us understand this. Let's say, for example, right, if our time comes and food, let's say, starts to run out, right, and everybody is still hungry. May Allah protect us from a situation like that, but sometimes it happens, right? Say food starts to run out, people are still hungry, they want to eat something. So we know people have this need now. I come in. And I've got all this food with me, right? In my car, I don't know, i got like 15 boxes of pizza, something like that, right? I know many of you uncles don't like pizza, but it's easier for the example, right? Let's go with that for now. So I've got all this pizza sitting in the trunk, in the back seat. I just have all this pizza. So I come out, and everybody's like, oh my God, thank God you have all this pizza because we're all hungry here and we ran out of food. I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, take care of yourself. This pizza's for me, right? What would you say? Like, ganjus out me. Like, what's wrong with you, man? Like, chair, come on. You have all this pizza. You don't need to keep it to yourself. If you have, you know, we need it, we deserve it, give it to us. If you keep it to yourself, we're going to call you stingy. You're your bakhil, like you can't do something like that. So, again, just understand the way that this analogy works. If Allah does not create, Allah himself saying, I'm not somebody that's bakhil, I'm not stingy. I am nothing, Allah saying, I'm nothing but pure, pure perfection. I'm a hidden treasure. If I don't create... All this mumkinat, all these mumkinat al wujud, everything else that could have existed can, can come complain to me. Allah, why didn't you create me? I wanted to know you. I wanted to understand you. I wanted to understand your words, the Quran. I wanted to know your Ahlul Bayt. If you didn't make me, that's, that's, he's being bakhil then. Na'udhu billah. Allah Himself saying, it's in my thought that I don't hold anything back. If you can handle wujud, then I'm going to give it to you. If you can come into existence, then I must give it to you because Allah is not somebody that holds back things. That's His reason for creating. It's this idea of pure hub and love. When somebody has that pure love within them, they want to share it all the time. Another example would be this, right? We were talking about you know, all this good food and everything. You know, sometimes you're out with everybody. Maybe you're at a restaurant, you order dessert. Maybe other people don't order it, right? You sit there, you get their ice cream or your you know, cake, whatever. You take a bite and you're just like, oh man, this is awesome. And you just keep talking about how great it is. Everybody else around is going to be like, you know, a little takalluf, like, oh, okay, it's so great, you know. If it's so great, you know, give me, give me a piece, give me a bite, give me something. When somebody truly understands how beautiful and amazing something is, the proper response is to share it with everybody else, right? Not to hug it to yourself. So Allah, because who understands Allah the best? Himself. So Allah has this thing called hubbi dhatihi. Allah understands his that. Nobody else can understand that. It's Allah's own recognition, his own ma'rifat of himself. He says, I'm so perfect and so beautiful, I can't keep myself to myself. I have to share it with everybody else. So he has to share this perfection. And you know what? If I just create some planets and stars and, and plants and animals, they won't understand that. They won't have the ability to. If I create angels, they can do whatever I command them to, but they won't understand that either. So in order for them to have that ma'rifat of me, to understand my beauty and my perfection, I have to give them this ability of free will now. So it's an extension of Allah's love. It's an extension of Him saying, I need... For somebody to understand what it feels like to be godly, to be divine. That's the way we understand, and that's how we reach our own kamal. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad.
Hopefully that wasn't too intense, too philosophical, too abstract. If it was, I mean, I have to stop here for now anyway, but hopefully it made sense, right? The general idea is when somebody loves something, they want to share it. When somebody's not conjuice, when they're not stingy. Obviously, there is no evil, there's no nuqsan, there's no deficiency in Allah. Because he's nothing but perfection, he has to the best of his ability, which is obviously perfection, he's going to share it with whoever can handle it. So he has to make somebody that can come close to it. And that's where we get this idea of Nur Muhammad. It's like, I have to make something that is so close to me that nothing else is in comparison to it. And that's where the Nur of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad comes from. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. It's literally, if we're putting it in quantitative terms, it's like Allah saying, how, what's the closest thing that can be like me without actually being me? Because nothing can be like Allah. We already said that. So like, what is like Allah minus one? Like that is Nur Muhammad. That's what it is. The Nur of the Ahlul Bayt is that. It's, the, it's one step removed from Allah. And that nur then comes down, and it's the reason that you and I are here too. The reason, it's in the Riwayat as well too. The reason you and I are here is because the Ahlul Bayt were made first. Our whole reason for creation is because of them. Allah says, look, I have to create a perfect role model and a mold and a template for everybody else. Otherwise, they won't know how to get to me. So I need to show everything else what does a perfect human being look like. So I'm going to make Muhammad and Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, and you'll see what perfection looks like. You'll see what it looks like when there's pure aql and no shahwa there. You'll see what a perfect father looks like, a perfect husband looks like, a perfect wife, a perfect mother, a perfect son, a perfect daughter. You'll see all these things, a perfect household, a perfect son-in-law, a cousin-in-law. Every single thing that you need, I've created for you. You've got no excuses left. If you want it, again, I've given you free will. You can have it. If not, then join the animals. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One more salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Mm. Inshallah, from tomorrow we'll continue a bit more with this topic and see how we can kind of uh, go with this idea of now that we have some understanding of our reason for creation, of why Allah made us, how, what are some practical tips to engage in self control? You know, what are some things that the Ahlul Bayt have mentioned to help us control our nafs and our ego and our lower, lower animal desires? You know, when we have a true goal, when there's something that's an object of our love, then nothing should be able to stop us, right? If it's something that we truly love, nothing should get in the way, and we should be able to go after that hadaf, that maqsad. You see that on a night like this, when Imam Ali is speaking with Umm Kulthum, and in their conversation, she finds out that, you know, the way that my Baba is acting, I haven't seen him like this before. This night is not like another night. I've seen him pray before. I know the prayers of my father. His prayer is different tonight. I've seen him in namaz shab His namaz shab is different tonight. I've seen him do giriya and cry in his ibadat. This, his crying is different tonight. I haven't seen my father like this before. That's where you see Umm Kulthum is trying to beg, Baba, don't go tonight. Just, just stay here. You know how we know in Ramadan, Imam Ali took special extra care and attention for all of his children. Ruwayat say that every night he would spend with a different one of his children. One night he would be doing iftar with Imam Hassan, another night with Imam Hussein, another night with Bibi Zainab. And it just so happens, on this 19th night, he's at the house of Umm Kulthum. What an honor it is for her to have a father like Ali to be able to host him for iftar. But also, what a wazifa and a burden it is and a taklif for her, it must be too. Right? You have to take care of your father, you have to take care of Mawla Ali, inviting him, you want to do all this intizam, you want to take care of him properly. But she says, you know, when you and I host, we want you know, to give and provide everything possible. But she knows, I know my father. If I put out too many things, he's not going to be happy with that. My father is not the type that wants all this kind of food. And this is things that you and I should remember too, as we commemorate the Shahadat of Imam Ali. You know, you know how we have these sayings sometimes, live like Ali, die like Hussein, right? We say this all the time. Live like Ali, die like Hussein. But you know, sometimes we say these things, our actions are a little bit different though, right? Sometimes we say, yeah, live like Ali, die like Hussein. Well, part of living is eating. Do we eat like Ali? Or are we eating like Muawiyah? Right? These are things we have to think about. How are we actually acting? What is the iftar of Ali on a night like this? What happens when Umm Kulthum comes out and brings in front of him. Again, trying to keep it simple because she knows her father. A little bit of salt. A little bit of yogurt or milk. Some narrations say yogurt, some say milk. 
and a little bit of naan, a little bit of just basic, basic, simple wheat bread or barley bread. That's it. And even there, she must be thinking, as a daughter wanting to take care of her father, I want to do so much more, but I don't want to offend my father either. I don't want to give him so much that, you know, he gets offended. So I'll give him a few simple things and hopefully this will be okay with him. But even there, Mawla Ali says, Ya Bunayya, Ya Um Kulthum, you know that I'm not somebody that goes against the seed of Rasulullah. These two things, two things together like this, three things together, you know that I can't eat something like this. Take one of these things away. So some narrations say they took away the, the yogurt or the milk. So they're salt and bread. This is our Mawla's iftar on night like this. And even then, even then, Riwayat say he had a small amount, barely ate anything, a few bites, that's it. And Umm Kulthum said, I did all this, I want you to come and enjoy at my house, I invited you for iftar, you're staying with me, I want you to eat properly. It's like, why are you eating so little? I know, you know, Baba, I know you don't eat much, I understand that, but why so little? Every other night I see you, you don't eat much, but you're at my house, you're eating so little, why are you doing something like this? And Mawla Ali breaks her heart and says, because when I go and meet my Rabb, I want to go in a state where I'm hungry. Maybe, maybe, some of our ulama say, maybe it's because, maybe Imam Ali knows that my Hussein, when he goes back to his rub, he won't even have a drop of water. How can me as a father go to back to my rub with a few bites of salt and, and bread? Maybe this is what is in Imam Ali's mind. Now, he's involved, he's in his ibadat. And as he's in his ibadat, he's walking, he's back, he's pacing back and forth. Again, Umm Kulthum is noticing all this, this strange and gharib ibadat that Imam Ali is doing. And when that happens, she goes and asks, like, Baba, why are you acting like this tonight? I've seen something very strange in you. I've seen you cry differently and act differently in your ibadah. What's happening here? He says, you know, this is a Laylatul Qadr for everybody else. But tonight, this is Ali's Laylatul Qadr. This is my Laylatul Qadr tonight. This is a special night for me tonight. Uh, very soon, I will be going back and coming back to my Mahbub. Rasulullah is mine. I've missed him for so long. And now Rasulullah is calling me back to him. And I'm going back to him. Baba, something's going to happen to you. Please stay here for the night. Don't go to the masjid. Tell Hassan or Hussein, tell them to go lead namaz. You stay here tonight. He says, no. Ali does not run from taqdeer. I never run from the qadr and qada of Allah. I will go and do my duty. But you see, this is what Ali wants, but the rest of the creation doesn't want something like this. As Imam Ali is leaving the house, as it's getting closer to the hours of Fajr, as this is happening, as he comes out, as we know in the riwayat, it says, if Insan knew what was going to happen, they would pull him back. But there was no one besides Umm Kulthum to try to hold him back there. So now the animals have to come out outside of the garden of Ali, outside of the garden in this, this area of Umm Kulthum's house. They say these ducks, these animals, these birds came and they were grabbing the abba and the cloak of Ali. And in their own language, their own way they do tasbih is, Ya Amirul Mu'minin, Ya Mawla, don't go, we know where you're going. We know what's going to happen to you, please stay here. This world, this dunya cannot exist without you. We can't live without you. You see, even the animals, they understand these things. But Imam says, no, I don't run away from these things. Let me go. He finally goes, makes his way towards the masjid. And as he's there, they say, some riwayats say, Imam Ali himself recited the adhan today. This morning, Ali himself wanted to call out to Allah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Calling the adhan, attracting everybody there. And then as they begin the salah, then this mal'oon is getting ready in the same way Ibn Muljam, na'anatullah alayhi, he's getting in this line as well as he is getting ready. He's moving closer and closer. Imam Ali is feeling his pull get back towards Rasulullah, back to Allah. He's getting ready. And finally, when he goes down, Allah sami alahu liman hamada, he goes down into sujood. This mal'oon comes out with this poison dip sword. He strikes Amir al-Mu'mineen on his head. And the lines come out from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Fustur Abdul. I have succeeded by the Lord of the Kaaba.
लोगों ये जनाजा है इस्लाम के बानी का हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का लोगों हो ये जनाजा है इस्लाम के बानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का बी बी ने कहा करबल में चले आना बी बी ने कहा में चले आना मंजर मैं दिखा होगी अकबर की जवानी का मंजर मैं दिखा होगी अकबर की जवानी का लोगों ये जनाजा है इस्लाम के बानी का हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का जहन अब ने कहा बा करबल से चले आना जहन अब ने कहा बा में चले आना मंजर में दिखा होगी अकबर की जवानी का लोगों ये जनाजा है इस्लाम के बानी का हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का गाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का कट जाएंगे बाजू भी आपस बाब पाके कट जाएंगे बाजू भी आपस बाब पाके तीरों से होगा चलनी मशकी सब पानी का लोगों ये जनाजा इस्लाम के बानी का है आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का बिखरेगा करबला में के सर का सहरा बिखरे कर बला हमें के सर का सहरा खुशियाँ समेट लेगा आलम वो वीरानी का लोगों ये जनाजा है इस राम के बानी का है आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का हशर मेरे मोहला मुश्ताक रहू तेरा ताशर मेरे मोहला मुश्ताक रहू तेरा मिल जाए शरफ मुझको बस तेरी गुलामी का लोगों ये जनाजा है इस्लाम के बानी का है आगाज हो रहा है करबल की कहानी का
متوجہ زیارت السلام علیکہ خاتم النبیین السلام علیکہ امیر المؤمنین السلام علیکہ سیدت نساء العالمین السلام علیکہ ایوہ الامام المجتبا السلام علیکہ ایوہ عبداللہ الحسین وعلا جمیع شہدائی کربلا السلام علی الامت المعصومین علی زین العابدین ومحمد الباقر وجعفر الصادق وموسى الكاظم وعلی ابن موسى الرضا ومحمد التقی الجواد وعلی النقی الهادی والحسن العسکری السلام علیکہ ایوہ صاحب العصر والزمان الامان الامان من فتن الزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهل الله مخرجك وجعلنا من أنصار ظهورك وعوانك السلام عليكم يا لبيت النبوة جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد
صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما مؤمنين مؤمنات ان شاء الله this is the first of our nights of qadr most of you are used to the different a'mal that we perform so this is just kind of a, a quick reminder about a few points that maybe we end up forgetting you know a lot of people one of the things that they end up asking on a night of qadr is about niyyah so I want to explain just a little bit about what niyat actually means. So a lot of us, the way, and this is the way that I was raised too, the way that I was taught, is that niyat is you have to say all these things out loud or in your mind. You have to say, you know, I'm reciting this, or may yiparton, qurbatan illah, et cetera, et cetera, wajib, qurbatan illah, et cetera. So the fatwa is that you don't have to say anything at all. That's not what niyat means. You don't have to even say it in your mind or in your heart, nothing like that. Niyat just means you need to be conscious and aware of what you're doing. Right? And that's for any... Any ibadah that you do, whether it's wudu, whether it's namaz, anything that happens, you just have to know what you're doing. If you're just randomly washing your hands and face, just because it's, let's say, hot outside, just randomly splashing water, you're like, oh, that's wudu now. No, no, no. You have to have, in the beginning, like, yeah, I'm going to do wudu. That's the whole point why I'm washing it like this. Not to cool off or anything else, that I'm actually doing a specific ibadah. If somebody's just randomly, like, bending down because their back hurts, oh, that's a ruku now? No. You have a specific form, right? The same way. When we were all leaving to come to the center, before we drove, did we say, I am driving to Zainabiya? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you knew what you were doing, you got in, you started the car, and you drove. <laughs> if somebody were to stop you, like if an officer, if a cop stop you, <laughs> if they stop you and say, what are you doing, where are you going? You say, I'm going to my, my Islamic center, I'm going for these programs. So they were asking, you, you know what you're doing? If you say, I have no idea where I'm going, they say, okay, it means you don't have a niyad then, you don't know what you're doing. So all of these are amal. You don't have to be like, oh my God, like Laylatul Qadr, specific night, wajib. No, no, nothing like that. It's just, this is Laylatul Qadr. You know that this is something that is recited on that night and that's enough, right? So you don't have to say it out loud. You don't have to put it in your, in your head or your mind, nothing like that. Hopefully this simplifies all the other ibadah too, right? You don't have to do something. Yes, it is helpful sometimes to kind of renew your niyyah and say, okay, Allah, this is something that you have sent down and commanded. You have sent it down with the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. We're following in their footsteps, and we hope we get the ajr, the thawab, and the reward for tonight. It's good to kind of put ourselves and reorient ourselves like that, right? So hopefully that's what we understand from niyat. Now in terms of, there's a lot of questions about Laylatul Qadr, right? I don't want to take up too much time. A lot of people ask, you know, what exactly is happening on these nights? Right? Translated sometimes, night of destiny, night of power, you know, what's going on? Qadr, another way you can understand is it's a night of measurement. The night of measurement, right? Taqdir can be translated as measurement too. Now, what do we mean by that? Let me give you an example. For all the people who are into cars here, hopefully this will make sense. What's the difference between a car that has, let's say, 100, 200 horsepower versus a car that's got like 1,000 horsepower? Right? It's ability to accelerate, right? things like that. How much, how fast it can go. Now, if we take both those cars, we jump on, what's that highway that's like the terrible one every single time we jump on it? Okay, every highway here, pretty much. <laughs> Everything here is terrible, right? So, does it matter if you're in a Formula One car or you're driving, you're, you're on a bicycle, you're going the same speed as everybody else. Nobody's moving. It's just stop and go traffic, right? Your horsepower doesn't mean anything. Some people, they have a lot of power and capability, but they're not utilizing it. Some of us have the ability to do better things for Allah, get closer to the Quran and Ahlul Bayt, but we're on the wrong road. We're on the wrong path. 
a lot of people tell me, you know, I wish I knew more about this subject, right? I want to learn about this. I want to get closer to the Quran. I want to know more about the lives of the Ahlul Bayt. Okay, great. There are almost infinitely number of books translated in every single language. Have you set aside time, some part of your day to read something? On our phones, fiqh masai are there too. We have a lot of issues in our communities, with all due respect, with fiqhi, fiqhi issues. We could spend a whole ashra just going through all of the issues that we have in terms of our wudu and our namaz, right? It's on an app, it's, you know, we have the Tawdi al-Masaid, one little fatwa a day, not a big deal. These are ways that we can practically improve, right? Just small little bits of change here and there. We have the ability, we have the power, but we're not utilizing it. So the idea then on this night is Allah, whatever power or ability that I have, that measurement that I have right now, I want to increase that, but only if I can be put on a path where I can actually do it. Right? Don't put me on this road where there's all this traffic, where there's a 25 mile an hour speed limit. I want to go on the Autobahn, right? I want to be able to go infinite. I want to be go you know, faster. I want to use this power. So put the things in my life, set up these tawfiqat in a way that I can actually you know, put the pedal to the metal. I want to floor it. I want to go faster. I want to get closer to you. I want to know more about the Ahlul Bayt. Now what that means besides actual du'as, which we're doing, we ask our hajat, definitely, to tawassal of Ahlul Bayt. All of that is needed. But there's a practical person, you know, part of it too. That okay, Allah, from here till next Laylatul Qadr, this one year, I'm asking you to just give me one year, increase these tawfiqat, all these opportunities, widen my risk, all of these things, and help me see and give me hikmat and ma'rifat and basirat so I can see what you set up for me. That and but that means we have to step forward too. Maybe that means cutting down on some sleep. Maybe that means cutting down on some food. Maybe that means whatever, you know, random dunyawi things I might be doing. Okay, cut it down a little bit. We're allowed leisure time. We're allowed to have fun. We have to turn it down just a little bit, right? So whatever we want, we increase our capacity, our taqdeer, our ability. We're setting up, Allah, this is what I want my destiny to be. I'm asking Allah, I want this to be. I want to be closer to you so that if in between this Laylatul Qadr and next Laylatul Qadr, if my Imam Zaman, Ajallahu Ta'ala Faraj Sharif, If he makes his duhur and his return, I don't want to be those who are caught in traffic. I don't want to be stuck behind and say, Imam, I couldn't reach you. I don't want to be one of those where the Imam comes and says, you want to join my, mo my movement, my army? You want to be one of my supporters? Your wudu is not correct yet. Your namaz is not correct yet. You can't recite Quran properly. You don't know anything about my forefathers. I'm coming with the sunnah of Rasulullah. You don't know anything about my grandfather Rasulullah. How are you going to recognize me? These are things that we can do. We don't need to wait for this. So from tonight, we make a promise to ourselves, a promise to Allah, and a promise to the Imam that these are the things that we want to engage in. So these du'as are supposed to expand that spiritual power, and hopefully will get us to that level, inshallah ta'ala. And hopefully also will help us lower our volumes when I'm trying to explain some of these things as well. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Some people don't have, they have voice power instead of horse power, right? So be careful with that. So, the... <laughs> I have to be careful too, right? <laughs> I don't know if I'll get invited back next time. <laughs> so, the a'mal, as we know, basically goes like this, right? There's a two rakat namaz, and some of you have already performed it, that's fine. Right, so it's two rakats over here. I've already explained niyat, so hopefully you don't have to ask that now, right? Unless you're talking, then I'm not going to repeat it now, right? So, the two rakat namaz is up there, right? In both rakats, surah Fatiha once, and then surah al-ikhlas, surah tawheed, seven times, right? Okay. Afterwards, there is a tasbih. I don't know if we're doing that together or everybody's going to do that on their own. Yeah. We'll do it together? Okay. So it'll be 70 times Astaghfirullah wa atubu alayh. We'll do that together. So we'll give everybody a few minutes so that they can recite this namaz. After this namaz, after that 70 times tasbih that we'll do, there's two other tasbihat that we'll perform. After those are performed, then there is obviously the Quran a'mal that we'll be performing, where we're taking the Quran. Now again, they're going to be passed out. Let's remember, this is a night where we're connecting back with the Quran too. Don't do any bi ihtirami to the Quran, please. Right? This is a book that we're supposed to be swearing our lives by. Everything Allah that my principles are, my life should be sworn by this Quran. That's why I'm putting it on my head. My nafs, my ego is lowered under this Quran. That's the idea. All right? So hopefully we keep that in mind as we're putting it there. And then of course, this Quran is nothing without the other part of the thaqalain. Without the Ahlul Bayt, that Quran for us is meaningless. But we have to remember, some people take the Quran and run away, and some people take the Ahlul Bayt and run away. Rasulullah made it very clear, thaqalain, you need both of these things, they both explain each other. Right? And that's why we have bi kitabik wa bi Muhammad and Ali and Fatima, we go through all of them. Right? This is what completes an actual Shia. So that's what we're asking Allah here. 
Allah increase my relationship with your Quran, with your words, and your Quran and Natik as well, with your Ahlul Bayt. After we do that, there's a few other short du'as as well that we will recite, inshallah ta'ala. So again, you can recite now this, uh, these two rakat namazes on your own, and then after a few minutes, then we will recite the tasbih together. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. You know, a lot of people when they translate something like istighfar or astaghfirullah, you know, they translate it as you know, saying, oh Allah, Allah, I'm sorry. And you know, that's obviously what it means, but it's a bit deeper than that. Istighfar comes from the word ghafar, which means to cover something up, to hide it from everybody else. So when we're asking Allah, when we're seeking this covering, we're saying, Allah, I've done all this guna and ma'asiyat in my life, and sometimes people find out about it. 
Sometimes my family finds out, sometimes the community finds out, sometimes everybody else finds out. Even if they know, they don't know. Let's say I've done it in private, then the malaika know. The angels on my shoulders, they witness these things, they see that. So when we're asking Allah to cover it, we're saying, Allah, don't let anybody know except you. Cover this up from everybody else, even the malaika. When I come to you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, I don't want anybody to know this but you. So cover up these defects, this guna, this ma'asiyat that I've done. But, you know, a true apology is not simply saying sorry. But a true apology is saying, I'm sorry for what I did and I'm not going to do it again. And that's where wa atubu alayh is. Tawba means I'm turning back towards you now, Allah. I was facing the wrong direction. I was facing away from you. I was facing the dunya. I was facing my shahwat and my desires. But now I'm done with that and I'm turning back towards you. So as we recite this, and we can recite it together seven times. Keep in mind all of these different things that you and I have performed that we, want, we don't want anybody else to know. We don't want the angels to know. We say, Allah, I'm sorry for doing that. All these different things. And I'm not doing it anymore. This Laylatul Qadr is the last. It's done for tonight. And now for at least one year, Allah, give me the tawfiq so I don't do these things ever again. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. استغفر الله واتوب اليه 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 صلوات على محمد وعلى ال محمد
I thought that this has a built-in count there. I forgot about that part. Allah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So now, it's almost as if we're saying the same thing again, right? This time we add Rabbi. Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu alayhi. What's the difference? Why would, before we didn't add Rabbi, and now we are. We said, okay, so before we said, oh, Allah, I'm sorry for what I did, and I'm not going to do it again. The idea of adding in Rabb, we're not just Rabb, but saying Rabbi, my Rabb. You know, Rabb sometimes, I've seen different translations, people say, you know, Lord or Master or these things. I don't think that does it justice. Rabb has, rububiyat has to do with this nurturing quality of Allah, this motherly quality that Allah has. When Allah is looking at us and saying, I know exactly what you need in every single moment. So when we're now doing istighfar, we should have more of a personal thing that Allah, you are my Rabb, you're the one you gave me everything that I needed, yet I still went against you. All these different benefits and blessings and ni'mat and barakat that you've given me, I've been abusing them. So now we're personally turning back and saying, astaghfirullah rabbi. You were the one who nurtured me and gave me this love that I needed to come back to you and I wasn't doing it properly. But now, Ya Rabbi, I'm turning back to you definitely. So hopefully after that previous istighfar, now we have a closer connection to our Rabb and now we're addressing him directly saying, yes, I want to come back to you and I want to make sure I don't do this again. Salamat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilay 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 
استغفر الله ربي واتوب اليه 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 استغفر الله ربي استغفر الله ربي واتوب اليه 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 اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد وعلى ال This is the night where, in a few hours, Fajr time is where our Mawla was struck by this Mal'oon. We recite this La'na on him, but you notice we don't even take his name. We say, Qatalata Aminul Mu'mineen. Right? We're talking about the, the killer. We don't even take his name because he's not worth it that we take his name. At the same time, this individual who we keep in mind, he had certain qualities that led him to wanting to go and plot this assassination on Amir al-Mu'mini. It's amazing that Ibn Muljam was actually somebody who was with Imam Ali first. He was with him in battles. He was somebody that loved Ali. But you see how love of the dunya changed him. When we send la'na on somebody like him, we're sending la'na on the sifat that he had too. And we're saying, Ya Allah, I hope I don't have this sifat too. Ya Allah, I don't have this kind of hubb dunya that's going to keep me away from your, the imam of your time. I hope that I'm not the type that when the imam of the time returns that I might be on the wrong side because I'm too in love with this place. I'm too in love with the dunya, with money, with power, with my ego, with all these different things. It's not just this one individual that we keep in mind. When we do la'na on him, on Yazid, on Muawiyah, on all these individuals, there's qualities that they had. These same qualities, we might have them in our souls too. So when we send la'na on the individual, we're also keeping in mind those qualities and we're saying, Allah, don't let this la'na come back on me because I'm just like these individuals. Ya Allah, keep these qualities outside of me too. Remove any sort of love of this dunya. Keep me in the love of Ahlul Bayt and never let this love of mine die. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma la'an qatalata ameer al-mu'mineen. اللهم لعن قتلة أمير المؤمنين 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 
اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة 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 أمير المؤمنين 
اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام اللهم صل على محمد So for the first part, the Qur'an is just open in front of us. And then for the next part of the dua, which we'll, I'll make a note of, that's where we put it on our heads. But now we're just opening the Qur'an. And we pray that Allah, when we open this Qur'an, we're praying by this Qur'an, we're asking through the wasila of this Qur'an. When we open this book up, when we're looking at it, it hopefully is not just a bunch of foreign letters to us that we can read. This is supposed to be the code for our hayat and our zindagi, right? This is what we're supposed to be doing in our life. These are the same things. These are the answers that the Ahlul Bayt were giving when anybody came to them with a question. When people ask them about how they prove their wilayat, they use this book. When people ask them for akhlaqi questions, they use this book. When they ask them for ahkam, they use this book. The Ahlul Bayt came and explained it to us. Our connection with the Qur'an increases our connection with the Ahlul Bayt. So we ask Allah by this night as we ask through the Qur'an, that this increases our relationship with this Qur'an and with the Ahlul Bayt as well. Salamat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad mu'ajjin farajahum A'udhu billahi al-sameel al-aleem min al-shaytan al-la'een al-rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Allahumma inni as'aluka bi kitabika al-munzal wa ma fih wa fih ismuka al-akbar wa asma'uka al-husna وما يخاف ويرجى أن تجعلني من عتقائك من النار أن تجعلني من عتقائك من النار صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وآله spend a minute or two ask for your hajat remember all of the مؤمنين مؤمنات all of your مرحومين مرحومات around the world remember all of the مظلومين who so spending this night of Qadr, some without home, some without food, no iftar, they have nothing. Your hajat should include the vuhur, the faraj of the imam of our time. And when we're praying for the imam to come back, we say, Imam, we don't want you to come back, but leave us aside too. We're saying when we're asking ajjil, ajjil, to come faster, we're hoping that we're going to be joining you as well. Ya imam, we're asking that you pray to Allah for us, that we can become one of your soldiers as well. Hajat. Ya Allah, we ask that you help us become better husbands, better wives, better spouses, better fathers and mothers, parents, better children. Help us obey the parents, the obey our parents the way that Allah you've commanded us to. Allah's parents help us raise children like the Shuhada of Karbala. Ya Allah, make our children better than we are. 
like give them the right tarbiyah, help us show them how that we can give them the tarbiyah. So that when the Imam comes, he smiles at us and says, you raised soldiers of mine. And we have that special station with the Imam of the time. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And now we place the Qur'an on our heads. We place it not just physically, but we ask Allah, say, Allah, this Qur'an, I'm physically placing it on my head. But this Qur'an is above me. This is the wasila between you and I, Allah. This is your alfa. These are your words. I'm supposed to be reading it and understanding it. Right? We're saying, Allahumma bi haqqiha bil Qur'an. This is, there's a haqq here. There's a reality here. There's rights that this Qur'an has. Allah, don't let me be unjust to this Qur'an. Don't let me leave it aside. Even if I have the Qur'an on my phone, let me read it once in a while. Let me come back to you. Let me understand what you want from me, Allah, through your Qur'an, insha'Allah ta'ala. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Allahumma bihaqqi hadha al-Qur'an wa bihaqqi man arsaltahu bi. وبحق كل مؤمن مدحت في وبحقك عليهم فلا أحد أعرف بحقك منك فلا أحد أعرف بحقك منك فلا أحد أعرف بحقك منك. Everybody, let's recite this all together. We're asking through Allah. We're asking through the Ahlul Bayt. Let us remember that this is the reason we're alive. This is the reason why we exist. Allah, through His Ahlul Bayt, have given us the right to come and understand Him. Bika ya Allah, 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 bika ya Allah. Bi Muhammadin, bi Muhammadin, bi Muhammadin, bi Muhammad. Bi Muhammadin, bi Muhammadin, bi Muhammadin, bi Muhammad, bi Muhammadin, bi Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. By the right of the one who was struck in just a few hours, the one who's in sajda, the one who's left behind these teachings, he is Abu al-A'imma. This is the father of our imams. All the Ahlul Bayt, they are there because of Ali. This is the one that we are crying for this morning. Remember when we were offering our fajr, Remember this same fajr that Ali was struck in. Let's make sure our fajr counts this morning. Bi aliyin, bi aliyin, bi ali, bi aliyin, bi aliyin, bi ali, bi aliyin, bi aliyin, bi ali, bi aliyin, alayhi salatu wa salam. Bi Fatima, bi Fatima, bi Fatima, bi Fatima, bi Fatima, bi Fatima. Bi Fatima, Bi Fatima, Bi Fatima, Bi Fatima. The one who went out and defended Wilaya, the one who stood behind that door defending her own Imam. Allah, give us the maqam where we can understand the haqq of Bibi Fatima, one who was there to defend Wilaya. Bi haqq Fatima, Bi Fatima, alayha salam. Bil Hassani, Bil Hassani, Bil Hassan. Bil Hassani, Bil Hassani, Bil Hassan. Bil Hassani, Bil Hassani, Bil Hassan, Bil Hassan, Alayhi Salatu was Salam, Bil Hussein, 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 Bil Shahid Karbala, Ya Hussein, Sayyid Shuhada, Bil Karbala, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. Bi Ali ibn al Hussein, 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 Alayhi salatu was salam, Bi Muhammad ibn Ali, Bi Muhammad ibn Ali, Bi Muhammad ibn Ali, Bi Muhammad ibn Ali. Bi Muhammad ibn Ali, 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 Alayhi salatu was salam. Bi Ja'far ibn Muhammad, 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 Bi Ja'far ibn Muhammad. 
بجعفر ابن محمد بجعفر ابن محمد عليه الصلاة والسلام يا الله you sent Imam Baqir and Imam Sadiq with all this علم with all this knowledge let us have just a small drop of that knowledge and help us to have more ma'rifah of both of them and understand the teachings that they've left behind بموسى ابن جعفر 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 عليه الصلاة والسلام بعلي ابن موسى 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 عليه الصلاة والسلام يا غريب الغربة معين الضعفاء والفقراء يا شمس الشموس أنيس النفوس أيها المدفون بأرب توس يا علي ابن موسى الرباء يا الرباء you were all alone in Mashhad there's nobody else alongside with you even Bibi Masuma came and tried to reach you and she was unable to come and see you now she's there you're there all alone by yourself Allah give us the haq give us the right give us the tawfiq to come and perform his ziyarat and her ziyarat inshallah this year and next year be Muhammad ibn Ali 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 alayhi salatu was salam بعلي ابن محمد 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 عليه الصلاة والسلام بالحسن ابن علي 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 عليه الصلاة والسلام يا الله we ask you by the حق of the Imam of our time allow us to be his soldiers allow us to understand his حق and his rights بالحجة 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 ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأسر والزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجه شريف صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد Ask your hajat once again to the haq of Muhammad and al-Muhammad Ask your hajat say Allah I know that I know that you're listening to us you're hearing us ya Allah we can ask you directly but you've told us to ask through your Ahlul Bayt, that's why we're asking them. If you didn't command us, we wouldn't do it. But Allah, we know that in our weakness, we need to ask through those who've given haq to. You've given that haq to the Ahlul Bayt, we ask through them so that hopefully, Allah, we taste just a bit of your ghufran, your mercy, your forgiveness, your lutf, your leniency. But Allah, we have these du'as, these hajat, all these people in our community who are in need, various different things. When we pray to you, Allah, maybe we actually don't deserve it. Maybe these things we ask for, we don't know what we're asking for. But Allah, you know better. Allah, your rahmah, your mercy encompasses everything. So we don't deserve these things, but Allah, you are the one who is worthy of giving us things that we ask for. Hajat. <coughs> Mu'minin, we ask our hajat and we ask, make sure we do a bit of introspection, tafakkur, reflection. Think about the issues that I have in my life. Allah, maybe I have a short temper. Maybe I'm rude to my family. Maybe I'm rude to community members. Maybe I don't help out. Maybe I don't give sadaqah. Maybe I'm stingy. Maybe I'm lazy. Whatever it is, Ya Allah, I'm specifically asking you through my hajat, through the haqq of Muhammad and Muhammad, I don't want this to be a quality in me anymore. I don't want this to be a characteristic in me. Take this away from me. At least give me one year where I don't have this quality and this trait. Help me break out of these bad habits, Ya Allah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One more salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now there's, I believe, 
uh, two or three short du'as for the night of Qadr that you'll recite. And a lot of these du'as are also ones that are just recommended in general to read on some of these nights. And you'll see, if you're paying attention, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a positive and negative to having these du'as on, you know, a PowerPoint slide and everybody can see them. It's good that, you know, we read the Arabic and we can follow along with the English translation. You know, it's very good. But sometimes, just looking at these slides as they pass by one by one, we don't have this sort of active focus on it. Sometimes we're just in the habit of trying to get this du'a done. Let me just read everything. Let me look at the translation. Let me make sure I read the English. Some ulama, they say, look, when you're reading these du'as, when there's some line that you see there, something that sticks out to you, you can stop the du'a right there. Don't continue and just connect with Allah based on that du'a. Why is Allah saying this? Why are we asking Allah for this specific thing? Why for hajj? Why for this risk? Why are we doing that? So if some part of this du'a calls out to you specifically, this is Allah calling to you specifically. So stop there and make your connection with Allah. You don't have to finish. It's okay if you don't finish the du'a. It's okay if you lose focus and concentration. Whatever bit of focus and concentration you have, whatever part of the du'a that calls to you, stop there, reflect a bit on that, and make your connection with Allah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان النعيم الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إني أمسيت لك عبدا داخرا لا أملك لنفسي نفعا ولا ضرا ولا أصرف عنها سوء أشهد بذلك على نفسي وأعترف لك ببعف قوتي وقلة حيلتي فصل على محمد وآل محمد وانجزني ما وعدتني وجميع المؤمنين والمؤمنات من المغفرة في هذه الليلة وأتمم علي ما آتيتني فإني عبدك المسكين والمستكين الضعيف الفقير المهين اللهم لا تجعلني ناسيا لذكرك فيما أوليتني ولا غافلا لإحسانك فيما أعطيتني ولا آيسا من إجابتك وإن أبطأت عني في السراء أو ضراء أو شدة أو رخاء أو عافية أو بلاء أو بؤس أو نعمة إنك سميع الدعاء فلا أحد أعرف بحقك منك صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد <تصفيق> اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم اجعل فيما تقضي وتقدر من الأمر المحتوم وفيما تفرق من الأمر الحكيم في الليلة القدر في القضاء الذي لا يرد ولا يبدل أن تجعلني من حجاج بيتك الحرام المبرور حجهم المشكور سعيهم المغفور ذنوبهم المكفر عنهم سيئاتهم واجعل فيما تقضي وتقدر أن تطيل عمري وتوسع علي في رزقي حاجات Allah, when we ask for our risk, risk is not just finances, risk is health, risk is having a good spouse, risk is having a good, a good children, risk is being able to use the resources that Allah has provided us to get closer to Him. This is what risk means. We're asking Allah, increase these things, increase my tawfiqat so I can capture a halal risk, which is the toughest thing that you and I can do in this age. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم ارزقنا توفيق الطاعة 
وبعد المعصية وصدق النية وعرفان الحرمة وكرمنا بالهدى والاستقامة وسدد ألسنتنا بالصواب والحكمة واملا قلوبنا بالعلم والمعرفة وطهر بطوننا من الحرام والشبهة وكفف أيدينا عن الظلم والسرقة واغضب أبصارنا عن الفجور والخيانة واسدد أسماعنا عن اللغو والغيبة وتفضل على علمائنا بالزهد والنصيحة وعلى المتعلمين بالجهد والرغبة وعلى المستمعين بالاتباع والموعظة وعلى مرضى المسلمين والشفاء والرحاحة وعلى موتاهم بالرافة والرحمة وعلى مشابخنا بالوقار والسكينة وعلى الشباب وعلى الشباب بالإنابة والتوبة وعلى النساء والحياء والعفة وعلى الأغنياء بالتواضع والسعاد وعلى الفقراء بالصبر والقناعة وعلى الغزاة بالنصر والغلبة وعلى الأسراء بالخلاص وراحة وعلى الأمراء بالعدل والشفقة وعلى الرعية بالإنصاف وحسن السيرة وبارك لحجاج والزوار في الزاد والنفقة وقب ما أوجبت عليهم من الحج والعمرة بفضلك ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد And just a quick announcement, uh, if you park your car in the Walgreen parking lot, please move your car because 12 o'clock they start towing the car and we have seen that they come sometime early like 11.30. So we hopefully we will finish before 12 but just a reminder that if you park your car in the uh, pharmacy parking lot, move your car from there. Thank you. That's okay. I mean not in the parking lot of the, in the pharmacy. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya dalladhi kana qabla kulli shay. Thumma khalaqa kulli shay. Thumma yabqa wa yafna kulli shay. Ya dalladhi laysa kamitlihi shay. يا ذا الذي ليس في السماوات العلا ولا في الأرضين السفلا ولا فوقهن ولا تحتهن ولا بينهن إله يعبد غيره لك الحمد حمدا لا يقوى على إحصائه إلا أنت فصل على محمد وآل محمد صلاة لا يقوى على إحصائها إلا أنت اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وآل محمد So I think that ends our أعمال for tonight Let's offer our hajat one more time And before we offer our hajat As we said one of the biggest things that we ask for tonight Is of course the return of our imam So let's all together recite dua faraj all heartedly saying that Allah when we're praying that your Imam returns we want to make sure that we are ones who are with him and not opposing him A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Raheem Allahumma kun li waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai fi hadihi al-sa'a 
وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أربك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا Once again, we want to salli ala Muhammad wa ala. Once again, we offer our hajat again. Remember, all of our ulama, our maraja, our rafa, all of those ulama who are the ones who are passing down the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, all that, all those gems from the Quran, they're the ones who are preserving, preserving the deen for us. Let us connect with them as best as possible. Let's connect to their books, their teachings, their lectures, whatever wisdoms we can derive from them. Allah protect them. Give all of our maraja and ulama a long life, all of these teachers of the Hawza, those who have been protecting the Sira and sunnah of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam. Assalamu alaykum Rasulullah Assalamu alaykum Habib Allah Assalamu alaykum Aba Izzal Huda Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Assalamu alaykum Aba Abdullah Assalamu alaykum Ibn Rasulullah السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا غريب الغرباء السلام عليك يا معين الزؤفاء والفقراء السلام عليك يا شمس شموس السلام عليك يا نيس النفوس راضي بالقدر وقضاء علي بن موسى رضا السلام على الأئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته